A Player's Guide to Waterdeep Dragon Heist First published in 2018 by Wizards of the Coast, this 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons adventure takes place in the fantasy city of Waterdeep as players are drawn into a treasure hunt against a series of villainous rivals. This video includes a 2 hour long in-depth look at the city called Volos and Chiridian, giving players a basic understanding of what wonders the city may hold out to them. Waterdeep Dragon Heist usually begins at 1st level and finishes at 5th level. Any race or class can find a niche within Waterdeep, though the adventure tends to favour more city-dwelling classes such as rogues and bards over more nature-themed classes such as druids and rangers. Important skills include persuasion to make good impressions, investigation to follow clues around the city, stealth to hide from prying eyes, and perception to notice hidden doors. Being able to speak all the major languages, such as Elvish, Gnomish, and Dwarvish, along with more obscure languages like Draconic and Undercommon, will help you uncover more secrets about Waterdeep. Rangers should pick the mountain or Underdark favoured terrains, though your dungeon master may have a different suggestion due to the city terrain. For favoured enemies, Elf, Dwarf, Gnome or Humans from the two humanoid choices should benefit most encounters. The following spells are good choices to prepare for any spellcaster. For cantrips, Dancing Light, Friends, Prestidigitation, Minor Illusion, Message and Mage Hand. For first level, Charm Person, Comprehend Languages, Detect Magic, Disguise Self, Identify and Sleep. For second level, Dark Vision, Detect Thoughts, Hold Person, Invisibility, Locate Object, Spider Climb, and Suggestion. If you're looking for a background that would base your character within Waterdeep, the following may be useful. Urchin, Soldier, Sailor, Noble, Entertainer, and Guild Artisan are great choices. But there's also countless other ways your character could arrive at Waterdeep from afar. I will now leave you with Volo and his Enchiridion. I know he's a bit of a blabbermouth, but I'm sure the tales of Waterdeep will inspire all sorts of character ideas for your adventure. Over to you, Volo. Volo's Waterdeep Enchiridion, A Visitor's Guide to the City of Splendors by Volothamp Gadar, under the generous patronage of the Lords of Melshimba, published by Tim Waterdeep Limited in association with the Fellowship of Innkeepers and the Fellowship of Carters and Coachmen. I, Volothamp Gadam, verily attest to the veracity of these words printed herein. Set your course by the truth, and you shall never be lost, no matter how far you wandered. I coined this well-worn adage myself years ago, and it has served me well in all of my travels. Consider any antimony, jack dictation, mendacy, obloquy, pasquinade, parapraxis, transducement, or similar found in this document to be corrigendum. Address all claims attached to. Abrogate fell swap, solicitor, 17 Munga Wars Way, Castle Ward, Waterdeep. Welcome, traveller. You have in your hands the foremost and most up-to-date guide in the city. Smiled over by none other than its open lord, Lord Ladriel Silverhand. This chapbook will serve you well until my seminal work on the subject, Volo's Guide to Waterdeep, sadly long out of print, but now a tome prized by collectors, can be updated and printed anew. Ask any broadsheet seller, innkeeper, shopkeeper, tavern owner, or bookseller if they'll soon have copies of the new edition for sale. Entering Waterdeep Likely you have already arrived in Waterdeep and borne witness to some of its many wonders. But in case this pamphlet has found its way beneath your worthy eyes in anticipation of your visit, due to the commendable efforts of some friends or family members who love you dearly, I shall explain briefly the circumstances of entry. You will have travelled through lands claimed to control by the Lords of Waterdeep long before you see its walls. If you come from the south by the tradeway, you'll have met the city guard at their post at Zunbridge. From the north by way of the long road, You'll have passed under their watchful eyes at the town of Rasalanta, and whether by land or sea, you'll likely also have been spotted by the Griffin Calvary, even if you have not spotted them. Worry not. Waterdeep is a welcoming city, and you will have nothing to fear from these guardians unless you lead a rampaging army of orcs, a horde of gnolls, or similar. They don't even require a toll to be paid. 
Uh, beware of any guard who demands a toll, and report the incident to the Magister of Waterdeep at your earliest convenience. If you have traveled in a large caravan or a ship, you will be required to register with the Magister at the gate at which you arrive, or with the Harbour Magister. Magisters can be easily recognized by the black robes they wear, and in fact are commonly called black robes as a result, and the city guard force that always accompanies them. Be aware that magisters can pass a sentence without a trial. It behooves you to treat them with proper respect. If you travel over land in a small party or alone, you aren't required to register with the magister unless your stay extends beyond a 10 day. At that point, you must register with the magister, either at the harbour, the gates, or at the city courts. Discovery of your failure to do so can result in a fine or forced labour. Of course, registration subjects you to monthly taxation. But, as a truculent old acquaintance from the Dales once told me, the sheep give the shepherd its fleece, or there'll be mutton for dinner. That is, the magisters will get you either way, so you might as well register up front. That said, many canny visitors with business for a month or a season betimes avail themselves of the hospitality of the inns in Undercliff, the pleasant farmland east of the city proper. The less well-off often find accommodation in the field ward, because neither are official wards of the city, they aren't subject to taxation. Note however that because both areas have yet to be formally accepted as wards of the city, they don't benefit from the securities of guild law or the protection of the watch. If you choose to follow this path, be on your guard. Fools rush where auditors fear to tread. Regardless of what size party you arrive with, or by what means, if you arrive by night or in winter, expect to register. In winter and at night, the gates are shut. Ships aren't expected at night or as regular occurrence after the first frost of the coming season, and are often met at the docking by a magister, or by a contingent of the guard who will hold travellers aboard until a magister can be summoned. None of these rules apply to the city's least used gate, the West Gate. The smaller gate opens into the mudflats, a mucky beach used by clam diggers, shore fishers, and others brave enough to bathe in the cold waters. Those who make a living through fishing with nets or traps also use this gate, keeping their small boats on the beach to avoid docking fees. Locals register with the guard as they exit and as they enter. No magister is stationed at the gate, but no new arrivals to Waterdeep are accepted here. If you approach by air, expect a vigorous pursuit by and confrontation with the Griffin Calvary. Only specially licensed individuals and mounts can fly over Waterdeep. It's best to land well outside the city and approach on foot. Your arrival in the city. The splendors that await you in Waterdeep are legendary. Each of the city's ward is detailed in this work, teaching you what to expect depending on where you are, as well as what thrilling things you might see and do. Before that, however, there are small matters of knowing something of the history of the place you visit and of understanding how to comport yourself in the Sword Coast's grandest metropolis. A long history, in brief. <clears throat> there shall come a time when our city, in its deep water bay, shall grow in fame and fortune across many realms and many worlds. Folk shall know of Waterdeep, our city of splendors, and sing its praises. I have seen it thus, and I will endeavor to make it true. A quote from Akaran, the first open lord of Waterdeep, Circa 1032 DR. People have inhabited the plateau on which Waterdeep stands for longer than human histories record. But as is the way across the dangerous north, civilization at the foot of Mount Waterdeep has crested and ebbed in great waves. Elf scholars assure me that it was once the site of Aelin Thaldar, the capital of the ancient empire of Ilifan. So it was already a glorious place when the dwarf prospector named Melar discovered the mithril beneath the mountain. In agreement with the Ilifani, Melar called kith and kin to mine under the mountain and the plateau. And thus clan Mirakin came to rule below as Ilifani did above. But this fruitful alliance lasted less than the lifetime of a dwarf, for the emperor of the elves, what they call a coronal, commanded that all leave in the retreat that the great exodus of the elves from Faerun to their mystical isle of Evermeet. Not all elves agreed with this edict, and many were determined to stay. Well, what emperor has ever willingly allowed another to sit in his throne? The coronal had all of Alothandar raised by magic, and the remaining elves splintered into separate kingdoms. The Malerkin, of course, saw this as a breaking of their bargain, and never again did they deal with elves. 
Instead, they tunneled ever deeper under the mountain, never to be heard from again. So it was that the humans who came to Deepwater Harbour found it empty and suitable for their own purposes. For more than a thousand years, folk lived and traded on the site that would become Waterdeep, but their identities remain a mystery, with a curious exception. We know that at some point during this period, the wizard Halastar Blackcloak built his tower at the base of Mount Waterdeep and came to rule the lands around until he, like the Malerkin, vanished under the mountain. Various warlords later claimed the plateau's harbour as their own, but it was one known as Nilmore who is best remembered. A history of Waterdeep, Age 1, Rise of the Warlord, records how Nilmore raised a wooden stockade to protect the settlements around the harbour, claiming rule over the town that by then was being called Nilmore's Hold, Town of the Waters Deep. War between orcs and elves in lands further north drove hordes of trolls south to claw at the fledgling city, and amid this danger, Nimor died of old age. Many bloody struggles unfolded between local folk and trolls, until the magic of a youth named Akharan turned the fortunes of war against the everlasting ones, which were destroyed or scattered. Agharan improved slowly in skill and power with the passage of years, until he became a great mage. He is said to have discovered a supply of potions of longevity, or has learned the art of making such, for he has lived on and on, still physically in his prime for decade after decade. A history of Waterdeep, age 2, the Lord's Rule Begins, records that in the year 1032 DR, Agharan, then in his 112th winter, argued with Rulor, who was the Lord of Waterdeep. Rulor wanted to use Waterdeep's acquired wealth and strength of arms to create a northern empire. Akharan defied him before all of the people, and Rulor ordered the mage to be chained. But when Akharan magically turned aside all who sought to lay hands on him, Rulor struck at the mage with his own sword. Akharan then rose into the air, just out of reach, and used his magic to transmute Rulor's blade into a hissing serpent. When the serpent struck Rulor, he died in full view of his shocked followers. Agharan then gathered the leaders of Waterdeep's armies and powerful families. While runners sought to bring them to the castle, flames roared and cracked in the empty warlord's throne at Agharan's bidding, so that none could sit there. Then, when the gathered host of worthies met in the audience chamber, the wizard seated himself on the flaming throne. Immediately the fires died away leaving both the throne and Akharan unharmed. From this seat, the very one on which the open lord sits to this day, Akharan decreed how the city would be governed. While he would sit as lord openly, a council of other lords of nearly equal power would rule with him, but the identity of those lords would be hidden even from each other, thus preventing any of them from being approached and influenced by bribery or threat. So it was that Akharan established the Waterdeep system of governance. Agharan was instrumental in establishing many of Waterdeep's other institutions, such as its Black Road Magisters, its Griffin Calvary, and the city's many guilds. The first open lord ruled wisely for over two centuries before the magic sustaining his health failed. He now lies entombed in his tower, which you can still see standing in the courtyard of the Palace of Waterdeep. Beware that you don't approach too close, however, lest you stumble into an invisible barrier, a force cage, I am told, that surrounds the tower. Within the barrier lie additional protective wards, as demonstrated by the floating bones of the last person who tried to defy them. The name of this poor soul has been lost to time, but the miscreant was likely a wizard who sought to steal the magic treasures that had been entombed with their former owner. They now hang in the air, beyond the invisible force cage, in a rough semblance of their natural position, occasionally displaced by a strong wind or mischievous children with long sticks. Agharan's wise rule is celebrated on the first day of Eliasus, which comes to be known as Agharan's Day. For more about this day, see the city celebrations. Many significant events stand out in Waterdeep's history, but none have had so great an effect on daily life than the three apocalyptic periods known as the Time of Troubles, the Spell Plague, and the Sundering, the most recent and hopefully final. On all these occasions, the actions of the gods at war with one another led to the loss and twisting of magic in the world. During the Time of Troubles, Waterdeep stood at the centre of events, but the effects of more recent crises can still be seen in the city today, 
even though they occurred at great distances from where Waterdeep stands. When the gods walked among mortals during the time of troubles, they were cast down to the world by the mysterious overgod Eo in 1358 DR. Until then, none but the gods had known of Eo's existence, and since then, we have learned little more. As we all know, the crisis began with the theft of the Tablets of Fate by the vile and ambitious gods Bane and Merkel, later joined by Baal. These mystic artifacts supposedly determine the extent of the gods' power and dictate how they use that power. As punishment for this affront, Eo cast down the gods, or the ones that humans worshipped at any rate, and then demanded that they return the tablets to him. But Eo was not as omniscient as it seems, nor overly wise. The gods didn't seek out the tablets, and thus it was left to mortal heroes to sort out the mess. They did so, their efforts culminating in Waterdeep. It was on the slopes of Mount Waterdeep that Eo was last seen, when he granted godhood to the human heroes Kelimbor, Midnight, who became Mistra, and Cyric. It is no surprise then that Waterdeep has since attracted a steady stream of pilgrims who worship Midnight at Mistra's temple and pay homage to Kelimbor in the City of the Dead. It might surprise you though to learn that Waterdavians have a short-lived perchant for worshipping Eo, the Sinashur, the great marbled pillared structure in the edge of the market, now rented out for private and public events, was built as a temple to Eo, but his worship fell from favour when all prayers to him went unanswered, and the folk realised they had no idea what he stood for or who he was. You can visit the Sino Shore to see sculptures and paintings of all the major participants and the events of the Time of Troubles. Entrance is free to the public on any day when no event, such as a meeting of the guilds or a noble coming-of-age ball or some such, is scheduled. In the year of Blue Fire, 1385 DR, the spell plague gripped the world. No one knew it at the time, but it had since been divine that Cyric's long hatred for Mistra boiled over and led to his murder of the goddess of magic. I was absent from the world at this time, indisposed by a force of an imprisonment spell. Elleminster has since explained the events to me, but I must confess that much of what he said to me made little sense. It was such a long lecture having something to do with stars, crystal spheres, and demi-planar reality mirrors. Suffice to say, parts of our world switched parts of another, and magic again was disrupted. During this period, the powerful magic fields that protected an effective water deep became unstable. This led to the disastrous activation of most of Waterdeep's amazing walking statues during an earthquake. In the years before, the walking statues often hid on the ethereal plane, to be called forth only in times of great peril. Many in the city doubted such massive sapient constructs were even real, let alone that they could guard the city invisibly. The spell plague confirmed their existence for all to see though, and each carved a swath of destruction through Waterdeep before it was stopped. Now the walking statues stand about the city in various states of readiness or disarray, one of the most obvious of Waterdeep's so-called splendours. After the spell plague came the Sundering. Elf scholars insist calling it the Second Sundering, asserting that the creation of Evermeet thousands of years ago was a similar happening. Regardless of the name you give it, the events that unfolded beginning in 1482 DR were the result of another world, called a beer, I am told, Passing again onto our own, the gods were once more cast into the mortal realm, and this time embodied the mortal beings known as the Chosen. The old troublemaker Eo seems to have been the cause of it all, though why he chose to cast down the gods was a matter of dispute, even amongst those entities while they were with us. Apparently, all of this was foreseen by Waterdeep's legendary wizard, Kelburn Arasun and it was only through his wisdom and the efforts of Elleminster and Lariel Silverhand, the now open Lord of Waterdeep, and a handful of others that the world was saved. According to Elleminster, Eo remade the Tablets of Fate as a result, restoring the Divine Order and separating Eber from Torrell. But take that as you may, according to that roguish Longbeard, he saves the world without anyone noticing every other month or so surviving in the city. Waterdeep is, and by large, the most civilized city on the Sword Coast, yet civilized doesn't mean safe, nor does it mean it's easy to navigate. 
Many day-to-day -day elements of life in Waterdeep that residents take for granted are, to new arrivals, a bevy of wonders and dangers not seen in any other settlement within a thousand miles. Here's what you need to know to survive your first few hours in the city. Mark this section for frequent reference. The Code Legal Waterdeep is no village led by hidebound hierarchs or a petty fiefdom ruled by the whim of a warlord. It is a city of laws moulded by Tyr's spirit of justice. As a rule, you can trust members of the City Watch to do their duty diligently, and you can expect that the City's magisters will be fair. If you have cause to come before the Masked Lords, or an open lord herself, rest assured that if your cause be just, justice will be done. If, however, you find yourself in the wrong, know that though it may take some time to weigh what is wrong on Tyr's scales, his hammer will fall, and it will be wielded by Waterdeep with a vengeance. Unlike in less civilized settlements, punishment for crimes in Waterdeep isn't typically used as public entertainment. Scheduled executions occur behind the high walls of Castle Waterdeep, and floggings are carried out by the watch post nearest the sentencing. The watch makes every effort to take individuals into custody quietly, so as to not disrupt other citizens. Those bystanders generally return the favour by giving altercations between criminals and the Watch a wide berth. Waterdeep has a complex library of law and customs set by precedent, and the main body of which can be read in the Code Legal. This document is available in multiple languages at the Palace of Waterdeep, and in the common tongue provided on request by the Magisters at the gates and at the harbour. Be aware that the Code Legal provides only an outline for typical sentences for various offences, and Magisters have broad discretion when meeting out justice as they see fit. Any Masked Lord can overturn a Magister's ruling, but there is rarely a Masked Lord around when you need one. Arms, Armour and Combat Individuals accustomed to the rough and tumble life in much of the North are often surprised by the fact that Waterdavians go about unarmed and unarmoured. Yet Waterdeep does not have any law that forbids the carrying of weapons or armour. Instead, it has a culture of civility that makes such behaviour unnecessary. Dueling has long been illegal in Waterdeep, as has any sort of act involving assault. Individuals caught brawling by the Watch will all be arrested and judged regardless of who started the fracas, or why. The tavern brawls that typically break out under the influence of too much drink will often be overlooked by the watch as long as the proprietor doesn't seek payment for damages and no one was significantly injured. Sport fighting, such as boxing or wrestling, is legal only if it occurs in a location registered with the city for that purpose. Additionally, any blade more than one foot in length is subject to an extra tax wherever it is sold, which helps to explain why water Davians prefer to carry knives and knuckle dusters for self-defense. Businesses and individuals do employ armed guards, but except for nobles or foreign envoys, few people travel about the city with such protection. As such, the sight of armed and armored individuals walking in the streets who aren't in the livery of the city or one of the noble houses inspires caution in most water Davians. Folk assume that you shouldn't bother lugging around such equipment unless you intend violence or expect that it might soon be visited upon you. City Watch The first soldiers you see in service to the city will be members of the city guard who patrol the roads leading to Waterdeep, watch the walls, guard civic structures and protect magisters. Waterdeep streets, however, are policed by altogether a different force, the City Watch. The similarity of their names often confuses newcomers, so I offer this handy mnemonic. The guards guard the walls while the watch watches all. You can recognize any member of the City Watch by their uniform, a green and golden rod doublet and a tall steel helmet. Each typically carries a long truncheon and a dagger and a buckler. Because most citizens in Waterdeep don't bear weapons, these tools prove to be more than an ample deterrent to criminal activity. Members of the Watch typically don't carry crossbows or other weapons to attack at range, but running from the Watch, though it may be a time on a tradition for local miscreants, rarely works out for newcomers in the city. I guarantee that all members of the Watch know the streets they patrol and that area's residents better than you do, even if you stay in Waterdeep for 10 seasons. The City Watch has watch posts throughout the city. These stations are often off the main thoroughfares, tucked away in small courtyards or at cross streets. 
A watch post can be recognized by the green and gold lanterns outside it, lit even during the day with a continual flame spell. A watch post serves as an organizational headquarter and armory. Anyone who wishes to report a crime may do so at a watch post in the event of a watch constable not being found elsewhere. A watch post typically contains a few holding cells where people arrested for crimes can be detained until their march to a courthouse jail before standing trial. Small squads head out from the watch post on daily and nightly rounds of the city streets or on special assignments involving protection or investigation. A mere pair of watch operatives might discreetly patrol the castle ward. In contrast, squads of eight walk the dock ward, increasing to as many as a dozen at night. If watch members spot trouble they can't handle, they blow shrill tin whistles to summon more of their members, an act that alerts nearby citizens as well. City watch members follow a strict code of conduct that makes them one of the most trusted police forces, aside from the paladin patrolled elder guard. As long as you don't engage in unlawful behavior, you can expect to be left untroubled by the watch. Watch talk. Members of the city watch employ a sort of slang in dealing with the public. As a visitor, it behooves you to know what they mean. What befalls means, someone tell me what's going on here. Hold means, don't move a muscle. Down arms means, drop your weapons. Talk truth means, answer me or tell the whole story. Robes refers to the black robes, in other words, one of the magisters. Do we need robes here? Or something similar should be taken as a threat. The watchful order of the magist and the protectors. Expect to be questioned at the gate or when you register with a magister regarding your ability to cast arcane magic. Wizards, sorcerers and other arcane spellcasters who intend to stay in Waterdeep for any length of time are required to register with the city and will be strongly encouraged to join the Watchful Order of Magists and Protectors headed by Blackstaff. Members of the Watchful Order are expected to render services to the city when called upon, acting as temporary members of the City Watch or City Guard. Their expertise often helps investigators determine whether magic was used to commit a crime in the city. Members can also expect to be tapped for assistance during and after fires, natural events that cause multiple casualties or other non-magical disasters. Members of the Watchful Order form more or less a sociable association in the city, working together to keep an eye on any spellcasters who opt not to join their guild. Any havoc caused by spellcasters in Waterdeep risks drawing the wrath of the Lords of Waterdeep, so it behooves the Watchful Order to watch all of its members. Coinage. As it should be expected of any city of standing, Waterdeep mints its own coins. All taxes, fines and guild fees must be paid in either Waterdavian coins or the currency of any member settlement of the Lord's Alliance. Though no law requires you to pay for goods or services in Waterdavian coin, the drudgery of weighing foreign currency and checking its purity prompts many retailers and operators of swift exchange businesses including drays and higher coaches, not to accept anything but coins minted in Waterdeep. Though you can trade your coinage for Waterdeep currency with anyone willing to do so, the exchequers at the Palace Waterdeep make exchanges with no associated fees. The queue there can be quite long, necessitating that you make an appointment, often a day or more in advance. For a swifter transaction, I recommend any member of the Guild of Trusted Pewters, Casters or of the Jewelers Guild. Both have the most reliable scales and abide by guild-wide rates of exchange. Be sure to exchange towels or harbour moons before leaving the city as their value greatly diminishes elsewhere. Taxes and Fees As established by the first year of the reign of the previous open lord, Dagart Neverembe, Waterdeep collects a monthly tax from all who live within its official wards. The tax is one shard per person above the age of 10 years and is collected door to door by patrols of the city guard on the last day of each month. Individuals who so desire can pay a single dragon in tax and receive a writ exemption for them for 12 months. But the writ must be produced every month when the guard calls or a new payment will be required. If the guard knocks at a door and receives no answer, a notice of lien with an estimation of tax is affixed to the door. The debt must be dealt with before the next month ends, with payment to be made to any magister. Those who have no fixed residence can still be taxed if they are confronted in any building, be it an inn or an outhouse. So if you're out and about on the last day of the month, 
You'll no doubt experience taxing traffic as the streets become clogged with people trying to avoid the collectors. Waterdeep also raises revenue by charging other fees such as the following. One nib per day for a rental of a stall in the market. One shard, above and beyond any fines imposed, from anyone convicted by a magister per conviction. One dragon per conveyance leaving the city empty or full. Five dragons per ship that touches the dock at Waterdeep, except for the city ships and diplomatic vessels, collected from the captain and covering the stay of up to 14 days. A ship that leaves the harbour and returns during that time pays the tax upon re-entry. In times of trouble, direct taxes can also be imposed. A fire tax, usually one dragon per household, levied whenever a fire destroys a large portion of the city. A wall tax or harbour tax, usually one dragon per household, raised to directly pay for the needs of repairs or expansions. A lance tax, raised to provide a payroll for mercenaries hired by the city when required usually one shard per household each 10 day until the Lord repeals the tax. Getting about Perambulating is the superior manner of experiencing the city in all of its splendours, but if you have come with your own conveyance, the weather is inclement, or some other reason drives you to use the roads, the following are facts you'll need to know. Waterdeep is a city of broad boulevards that thrum with traffic. All day and well into the night, a bewildering melee of wagons, carts, horses and pony riders, carriages, buggies, hire coaches and water deep signature towering drays, as described momentarily, surges through the major thoroughfares. Fortunately, most roads are flanked by paved sidewalks that give pedestrians plenty of space. And most of the widest roads have raised dividers that allow an individual crossing a street a safe space to step out of the fray and wait for traffic to pass. The city's century-old layout dictates its traffic patterns today. Waterdeep lies on a plateau adjacent to the Long Mountain that shields much of it from the sea. In the southern third of the city, where the land slopes up from the harbour, the High Road and the Way of the Dragon are the two main south-north roads. These converge both at Weymoot, near the southern gate, and at the heart of the Trade Ward, where the city is its narrowest, bounded by Castle Waterdeep, high on the spur of the mountain, and the walls of the City of the Dead. The conjoined boulevard then splits to the north, continuing as the High Road, and to the west as the boulevard called Waterdeep Way, headed towards the Palace of Waterdeep, not to be confused with Waterdeep Castle, which it passes hard by. In the middle of the city, six boulevards run north from Waterdeep Way, where they meet the road that encircles the market. On the other side of the market, five boulevards continue north. The aforementioned boulevards, along with the street of the Singing Dolphin in the Sea Ward, are the major arteries of the city. Higher coaches and drays can be most frequently found on those streets, and the traffic is its most hectic there. Most other roads in the city run east to west, but regardless of their direction, traffic elsewhere is generally less hectic, and thus safer to cross. Street Signs Thanks to the Scriveners, Scribes, and Clerks Guild, Waterdeep has a remarkable custom of labelling its streets, and many of its alleyways and courts. The method of identification varies by ward and neighbourhood, including brass plates, carvings in stone, and stencil-painted wooden signs but the street names are typically displayed on the corners of buildings and at intersections, roughly a dozen feet above the ground. The name of the road you travel on will be on the wall nearest, while the name of the crossing road will be around the corner. Simply ingenious. Landmarks. Proud Mount Waterdeep provides a useful landmark for general orientation. It stands stark across the skyline to the west, its far slopes dropping right into the sea. A spur of the mountain juts inland, and atop the easternmost point of this spur stands Castle Waterdeep. If you can see these landmarks, it's relatively easy to orient yourself. The mountain peak looms over the southern third of the city, near the port in the south. The City of the Dead lies opposite the northern ridge of Mount Waterdeep, which descends to the Field of Triumph, the city's great coliseum. One of Waterdeep's titanic walking statues, no longer mobile, offers another way to orient yourself on a local scale. At nine stories tall, twice the height of any building nearby, the Honourable Knight stands guard in a block of buildings between Snail Street and the Way of the Dragon. 
Positioned as it is nigh the place where four wards meet, you can use it to judge where you stand. If it is south and west of your position, you are in the trades ward. North and west, the southern ward. South and east, the castle ward. North and east, you are in the dock ward. Traffic Wardens During particularly heavy traffic and at congested areas such as the Great Oval Road around the market, you might see a member of the City Watch serving as a traffic warden. Traffic wardens signal with a small blue hand flag for traffic to proceed, and with yellow flags for traffic to hold. A traffic warden can often be heard blowing a whistle. When you hear it, look to the warden to see if you are being signalled. Failure to take care might result not only in accidents, but also arrests. Drays These towering vehicles, I believe, are unique to Waterdeep, invented by exiles from Latan in the last century. A dray is a long, glassed-in carriage with bench seating that provides additional open-air bench seating on the roof. The driver sits at the level of the roof seating, providing a vantage point to see over other traffic, and makes eye contact with other dray drivers. You can enter this contraption through the back whenever it stops or slows down enough to make mounting the rear step safe. A fare taker stands at the back of the lower seating area to take your coin, typically two or four nibs. You can choose to ride instead of ascending the spiral stairway at the rear or ride atop the vehicle. Most drays run on the main north-south boulevards, but some encircle the market. A few run along the small east-to-west roads in rough areas. Be warned that the demand for drays is high during rain or snow, or to get to or from an event at the Field of Triumph. Conditions become crowded and perfect for pickpockets. Higher coaches. If you desire to travel in relative comfort and be the masters of your destination, simply give a spirited wave and shout to any hire coach driver who has no passengers. Each of these handsome two-wheeled black coaches comfortably seats two travellers, perhaps four if you're quite slim and very well acquainted, who ride facing the road ahead. The hire coach's driver sits high and to the rear of the carriage, manipulating the horses by means of long reins and a short whip on a rod. The fare must be agreed upon and paid before the journey, but only rarely will this cost exceed half a dozen shards. Carriages The well-to-do or those who want to ride in luxury during a day out can hire a full carriage, many of which are finely outfitted as those owned by the nobility. Up to eight can take such a ride in a silken comfort. Prices and services vary, but generally you agree to rent the carriage and the services of the driver and any attendant or guards for a full day. Travel in winter. The folk of Waterdeep often remain indoors in the colder months, particularly when it rains or snows. The flow of trade and travellers into the city slows to a trickle during winter, and as a result, traffic diminishes and drays and hire coaches become more scarce. Fortunately, the Fellowship of Carters and Coachmen works with the Wheelwrights Guild and the Wagon Makers and Coach Builders Guild to convert the drays and hire coaches that do operate into sledges, so that some are available even in the worst weather. The Unflappable Water Davian Natives of the City of Splendors are notoriously slow to take offence. A Water Davian plainly states their feelings as a warning, so that one is apt to hear, I don't find that amusing, friend, said pleasantly before real anger is shown. Some visitors misinterpret such behaviour as cowardice or ignorance. He was too stupid to realise I insulted him. For those who act on such misjudgments, however, surprise and regrets are the usual results. Most Water Davians are slow to take fright unless facing magic or monsters. A swaggering warrior threatening them is quite likely to be stared at calmly or even sneered at. The only mortal Water Davians fear are the few unstable wizards and their lords. Dernan often says to those who are surprised by the nonchalance of the yawning portal's regulars concerning the entrance to Under Mountain in their midst, and only when they've incurred the wrath of said persons themselves. Nobility. While you might encounter dwarf diplomats from Gauntelgrim, satraps of Am, duchesses of Tethia, or thanes of the Northlanders in Waterdeep, the nobles you really need to know about are the city's own. 78 noble family lines are found here, many of which can trace their lineage back to the city's founding. Books have been written about individual families, histories of their accomplishments and how they fit into the web of wealth and patronage that govern nobles' activities. So it is beyond the scope of a pamphlet this size to attend to describing their particulars. 
I can, however, endeavour to equip you with the tools to recognise nobility and to interact with the higher class. Spotting a Noble Nobility in Waterdeep are granted the right to bear arms. In the legal code of the city, this means not merely the ability to carry a weapon, but the right to retain up to 70 equipped soldiers. These soldiers always wear the house's colours and the house's arms of grace, a heraldic device often borne on a shield, worn as a cloak pin, or affixed to a helmet. Others throughout the city, even foreign dignitaries, are permitted to retain only up to 16 armed warriors, and laws against impersonating those in the employ of the nobility mean that other mercenaries and bodyguards most often dress plainly, so as to not be mistaken for the retinue of a noble. So your first clue that you might be in the company of a noble is a sight of large armed and uniformed soldiers. Many nobles, particularly younger ones seeking entertainment, travel without an entourage of guards or only in the company of other nobles. In this case, you'll know you're in the presence of nobility because of the defences others give to them. Follow suit and you should be fine. Above all, be polite. Always address a known noble as Lord or Lady. A short bow or a nod of the head to acknowledge a noble upon each meeting and parting is customary. Obsequiousness and civility is something all Wardavians scorn, but you should also beware of acting in an overly familiar, boastful or disrespectful way when in the presence of any noble. Though this sort of behaviour isn't a crime, and laws against duelling prevent the noble from initiating a direct armed confrontation, the noble families of Waterdeep have immense power in the city, often in unexpected quarters. Many have influence in nations as distant as Kalimshan and Kormir. Be assured that any slighting of a noble will not be forgotten or easily forgiven. If you're not certain of whether someone is a noble, address the gentleman as Seya, or the gentlewoman as Goodwoman. Neither will give offence, and generally a noble will politely correct you as to their actual title. Nobles and Patronage Nobles in Waterdeep are patrons of and investors in all manners of business in the city and abroad, as well as many expressions of the art. They spend coin to fund celebrations, contests at the Field of Triumph, upkeep the city's temples and shrines, civic projects, guild events, and charitable actions such as the burial of the unknown dead. Their motives are manifold, but their actions, no matter the reason, earn them loyalty and high regard from those who benefit from their largesse. Seeking patronage from a noble without having been introduced to that person is considered an insult, so you must first befriend someone in a noble's employ or circle of influence. Doing so is no guarantee of ultimate success. Much time and coin can be wasted trying to curry favour with an acquaintance of a noble who turns out to be unscrupulous or of little help for some other reason. My advice is to do something deserving of attention, whatever your vocation, and someone from the noble families of Waterdeep will eventually show an interest. No, a noble's business. In the words of the quarrelsome acquaintance of mine from the Dales, before you strut your stuff with the chicken's preening circle, get to know the other cocks first. This colourful aphorism applies well to the affairs of nobility, because when you have an interaction with a noble, you are at the same time dealing with one's entire family, as well as a network of business associates and allies. That situation can put you in a troublesome spot if you are unaware of the noble's connections. A wondrous people. Whenever you find yourself in a bustling city, you're likely to spot a wonderful variety of folk. You hear words in languages utterly foreign to you, and you smell dishes both delectable and strange. Waterdeep is the ultimate city of such delights, and before long the alien thing becomes familiar to you, and the stranger becomes your friend. The people of Waterdeep are among the greatest of its splendours. Fashion, comportment, love, these things are practised with an art and zest in the city uncommon elsewhere. Visit a feast hall or festival and see for yourself. And don't miss the cross-dressing performers who regale audience with humour and song. Fabulous. That word doesn't begin to describe it, especially when they enhance the merriment with magic. The city is also a haven for those who define for themselves what it means to be a man or woman, those who transcend gender as gods do, and those who redefine who they are. What confidence! I never tire of witnessing it. I have seen folk in Waterdeep whose lives are more magical than the marvels possible with spells. 
guilds, and guild lore. No aspect of life in Waterdeep goes untouched by at least one or more of the 40 guilds. Virtually every profession is associated with a guild, and there's hardly a citizen in the city who doesn't belong to one or more guilds, or doesn't work for someone who does. As a visitor to Waterdeep, you need to know this, lest you run afoul of guild law. Guild law isn't technically the legal code of Waterdeep, but guilds are mentioned with the oldest surviving legal documents, penned by Agheron himself, and the rules of the guild law are respected by wise city folk. Guilds take their laws seriously, as do members of the City Watch and the Magisters. If you flout a guild's traditions, you can expect not only public scorn, but also a visit from the enforcers of law. In addition, many guilds have their own codes of accusation, trial, and punishment, such as A member of the Baker's Guild who sells bread baked in the wrong shape will be drenched with water and coated in his own flour. Heckling a member of the Jester's Guild will result in the offending party being jeered at in public by no less than four guild members for a period of four days. Any ship that unloads its cargo without due observance or aid from the Guild of Watermen shall have its cargo seized or thrown into the harbour. Many guilds have their own codes that entwine each other, complicating matters even more for the outsider. In Neverwinter, if you want to construct a building, you simply purchase the land and hire the workers to build it. In Waterdeep, the Surveyors, Map, and Chartmakers Guild must first be consulted upon designation of the plat, then brought to draw or approve the construction plan. The Cellarers and Plumbers Guild must then clear and prepare the site, only after which you'll be able to hire members of the Carpenters, Roofers, and Plasterers Guild to erect the structure. Moreover, the work will not be complete until the members of the Guild of Fine Carvers and the Guild of Stonecutters, Masons, Potters, and Tilemakers design and craft any decorative elements of wood, stone, or ceramics. And after the most careful order of the skilled smiths and metal forgers has manufactured and installed any door hinges, if the building is to be connected to the sewers or to the city water supply, the Cellarers and Plumbers Guild must be called upon again to do that work. Want glazed windows installed? For that you'll need to hire members of the Guild Glassblowers, Glazers and Spectacle Makers. If you do business in the city with anything other than the purchases of goods and services, I strongly advise you to seek out a local solicitor and pay to be guided through the process. No Guild of Solicitors exists, so be sure your choice comes highly recommended by individuals you can trust. To learn the peculiarities of any guild rules, consult someone on duty at the guild headquarters, or ask a senior guild member. All that said, working at a guild-related profession without being a member of the guild isn't illegal. Guild members have no lawful recourse to interfere in the business of someone who chooses not to join an organization. But if you practice a trade or operate a business without becoming a member of the appropriate guild, Word spreads, and you'll find that your coin isn't as good for purchasing the goods or services of anyone who is a guild member. Since that group includes virtually everyone who sells the necessities of life or offers shelter for a fee, the benefits of joining a guild swiftly becomes apparent to those who procrastinate in this regard. The Wards of Waterdeep Newcomers to the city of Waterdeep are often confused by the importance that Waterdavians give to wards. In other cities such as Boulder's Gate and Neverwinter, districts are bound by rivers or walls, but in Waterdeep one could traverse from one ward to another ward by crossing the street, a fact that offers the drivers of higher coaches some amusement when an ignorant tourist requests a ride to the adjacent ward. Each ward has its own history, legends and traditions based around who lived there in the past, famous or infamous events, and the uncanny things that continue to occur. For example, children, and even some adults, hop on one foot when crossing Agma's alley in the castle ward. Why? Well, Agma was an apothecary that poisoned many patients, then buried them upright beneath the alley in the cover of night. He was discovered, and some say that as many as 80 bodies were subsequently pulled from the holes under the alley's wide flagstones. Though this happened over a century ago, children passing through the alley still sing a song, Hop for a hollows, hop for the dead, Hop for the flagstones, hop on their heads. As you stroll down Warrior's Way or the Street of Silver, listen for the children's delighted screams and go give it a try. These shared stories and traditions impart each ward a different culture, much as the distinctions of class and wealth. Yet nothing drives residents to identify their wards as much as festivals and sports. 
Nearly every race and parade in the city feature a competition between wards as part of the festivities. On such days, homes and businesses fly the colours of their wards, trot out their mascots, and sing rousing songs to celebrate where they live. If you stay in the city for even a month, you're sure to see some version of this display of civic spirit. Speak like a native. The many idioms and slang expressions of Waterdavians would take a whole book to explore, but here I explain a few that might otherwise mystify. Dabbler but no master, and no mastery blazing forth. These idioms trace their origin to Agharon, who early on in his studies of magic humbly said, I am no wizard, I am a dabbler, but no master of magic. It seems no mastery bones within me. Both now serve as expressions of false modesty applied to any skill or craft, not just magic use. Sharp jaws, fast fists, woolly blades, and alley blades. Those who boast of martial skill but who shrink from violence or lack real ability are sharp jaws. In sharp contrast are Waterdeep's fast fists, any lout easily provoked to violence. Bully blades, battle-hardened mercenaries hide as muscle, and alley blades, muggers and thieves. The long ride and last ride. To a caravan merchant, a drover, or a farmer from the lands of Waterdeep, as well as any Waterdavian who rides for sport, recreation, hunting, or falconry, the late afternoon is a long ride, and dusk is a last ride. Which the greater thief? Tezura Hollow Hands was a famous lone cat thief in Waterdeep in the 1200s DR, who disappeared suddenly and is thought to have come to a violent end. She once robbed a wizard and wrote on his wall with a fingertip dipped in his favourite red wine. I take things. You take freedom with your spells. Which of us is the greater thief? Waterdavians now use this phrase in arguments with one another over all kinds of matters when comparing wrongs done. Doth thy mirror crack? Or, hurl but think not. Or, take but not count cost. Be nothing then. Lariel Silverhand, the Lady Mage of Waterdeep, when she was married to Kelban, Blackstaff Orison, once publicly rebuked an overambitious wizard of the watchful order of magus and protectors thusly, if I hurl spells but think not of consequence, I am nothing. If I take lives but count not the cost, I am nothing. If I steal in the night and not see the faces of the devastated come the next morning, I am nothing. If I make decrees like a ruler but undertake none of the other responsibilities of the throne, I am nothing. And if I do all these things in the name of the watchful order, I am less than nothing. Doth my mirror crack. These scornful words are remembered and almost used daily in Waterdeep, even a century later. Sea Ward The Sea Ward stands proud on the high ground above Mount Waterdeep's sunset shadow. The rich and powerful, or those who wish you to think such of them and can afford the rent, reside or run their businesses here. When the warlords and pirates of early Waters Deep gained enough gold, they built fortresses on what used to be fields of grass tussled by sea wind. You can still see the remnants of some of those old castles incorporated in the palatial homes of the noble families that dwell in the sea ward. For the best all-around view of the glittering homes enshrouded by garden walls, go to where Diamond Street and Delzerin Street cross, nigh to Mistress House of Wonder, and simply spin in a circle. Blue and gold are the sea ward's colours in competitions, and the ward's mascot is a sea lion, a fantasiful combination of fish and feline. There's a persistent but patently false legend that the once famous lion gate at the Field of Triumph is the gaping moor of a sea lion. The architectural designs for the gate show this to be false, however, and they can be viewed in the map house, the guild hall of the surveyors, map and chart makers guild in the castle ward. Must-see locations in the Sea Ward begin, of course, with the Field of Triumph, but just across the street is no less remarkable, the House of Heroes, the largest temple in the city. Dedicated to Tempest, its many grand halls celebrate the city's champions of both battle and sport. The winners of ward competitions are parted here after their victories, often carried on shoulders or passed from hand to hand over the heads of a crowd. It is a sight you shouldn't miss. You should also visit the House of Wonder, 
This is surely the most splendid temple dedicated to the gods of magic, with Mistra foremost among them. Of course, in all the world. Although your eye will be drawn to its ornate towers, brilliant mosaics and magical displays, look also for the humble violets growing amid the ostentation. These delicate flowers were Agheron's favourite, and they are planted about the temple in memory of him. Two other temples in the ward are as impressive, but in different ways. The beauteous House of the Moon has the tallest tower of any temple in the city, rising some 70 feet above the street. At its top, priests of Sayun bask in the light of the moon in all seasons. The House of Inspired Hands, dedicated to Gond, presents an altogether less peaceful experience. Here, all the great innovative minds of the city invent and experiment, attempting to create anything from flying machines to stronger door hinges. But don't expect a museum of marvels such as can be found in Boulder's Gate. At this site, worship is work, as anyone at the temple is liable to tell you. If you're looking for some good fortune, you should surely visit the Tower of Luck. This temple complex dedicated to Tamura, the tower in question is actually a many-pillared atrium, ingeniously roofed over with glass. Beneath the roof, a bronze sculpture of a diminutive Timora, depicted as a laughing young girl, appears to be leaping from the very top of an astounding fountain. To pay your respects and make a wish, you can come around to the fountain on a walkway and toss your coin to Timora. Managing to land it in her outstretched hands is surely a sign of her favour. If you need to refresh yourself during your travels, or perhaps to primp before an important meeting or a night out, visit Soon's Faithful at the Temple of Beauty. Its marbled public baths and mirrored salons are open before dawn to after dusk. There's no fee for the service, or for the advice and aid of the temple's many pleasant attendants, but donations are encouraged. Two parks in the Sea Ward might also be worth your time. The Shrine to Nature, just a block away from the Tower of Luck, are resplendent gardens dedicated to nature gods like Maliki and Sylvanus. The park is closed to all except the residents of the Sea Ward, yet from beyond the iron fence that surrounds it, you can catch glimpses of the suburb shrines, statues and fountains within. The Hero's Garden is the only green space in the city that is open to the public, besides the City of the Dead but it is tucked so far away in the north of the Sea Ward that it gets few visitors, which is a pity, since the fine statuary in this lush garden portrays many of the figures important to the city's history. I hesitate to mention the last location in the Sea Ward, and I will not reveal where to find it, for reasons that will soon become apparent. There is a house in the Sea Ward without windows or doors. You can't see it from the street, and those who live near it will not speak of it to others. You will know when you are near it, when you see the blue tiles on the streets and the walls leading into an alley that passes under the surrounding buildings. At night these tiles glimmer dimly with blue light of foxfire. More than one route leads to the blue alley, as this place is known, but there are few precious ways out. Most who enter don't come back. If you see blue tiles, turn around and walk the other way, before it's too late. North Ward Nobles are plenty live in the North Ward, but the characters of this ward are more peaceful than that of the Sea Ward. Though it has taverns and shops to suit a variety of tastes, the tenor of the area tends towards reserved and polite. Most streets are lined with a row of houses, inhabited by families of prosperous people of business, investing and civic service. They are each wealthy enough to employ a servant or two, and they endeavour to appear as such. For the best experience in the North Ward, go there just before dawn, buy a broadsheet, and settle in the cafe with the view of the street. Watch as the ward comes quietly to life around you. At first, it will be so silent that you'll be able to hear the resident a street over who opens her sash for fresh air and clears her throat. Then the birdsong will begin, and shortly thereafter you'll hear and see the drays arriving with servants. These aren't the live-in staff used by noble houses, but people hire to come and work for a day. Most of them come from less affluent parts of the city, arriving with tools of their trade and outfitted in their customary garb. Launders and cooks in white, chimney sweeps and house cleaners in black, valets and childminders in grey, gardeners in green and tutors in blue. As these servants spread out to knock on doors and begin their work, 
the residents of the ward take their exits, parting fondly with spouses and children, their footsteps tramping along the sidewalks, or taking them into the rattling hire coaches. In the span of just an hour, the North Ward comes to noisy life, and then settles again into quiescence, later until the day when the process reverses itself, as residents return from work and servants leave. The liveliest and perhaps loveliest part of the ward is Cliff Watch. Here the plateau upon which Waterdeep sits features a cliff so steep and high that the wall is interrupted to either side of them. Some of the most lavish residences and most luxurious taverns and inns of Waterdeep stand along this space, boasting terraces and balconies that allow one to take in the beautiful sight of the countryside to the east. Yet you need not pay their high prices, for a public walkway along the cliff's edge offers pedestrians ample opportunity to enjoy the view. The North Ward's colours are green and orange, and its mascot is the gentle white dove, depicted in flight. Many North Ward homes have dovecots in their roofs, and the great flocks of birds that circle over the city at dawn and dusk are a delight to behold. Castle Ward The Castle Ward is the heart and mind of Waterdeep, if not its soul. It houses the city's military forces, courts, government, and the market, the largest market square of any city in the north. It encompasses the city's navy docks and the Great Harbour, and all of Mount Waterdeep. It is home to six walking statues, numerous temples, and many other landmarks. Castle Waterdeep stands above the city on a great bluff that extends out from the mountain, its towers soaring hundreds of feet into the sky. It surprises many to learn that this isn't where Waterdeep's rulers reside, nor from where the city is governed. The castle was and is a redoubt of last defence should the city be attacked, but for well over a century, the ruler of Waterdeep has occupied the Palace of Waterdeep, also known as Pegarian's Palace, and is still called that by the elderly and long-lived citizens, including many elves. Though not quite as large as the castle, the palace is far more comfortable and lavishly decorated, with many halls used by government officials, guildmasters, and nobles for meetings and court proceedings. If you have a reason to be invited, not compelled I should hope, to meet with the Mask Lords or the Open Lord of Waterdeep, it will likely take place in the audience chamber of the palace. There you can witness the ancient and humble throne that Agharion first sat upon so long ago. Many other buildings in the ward are given over to city business, including several courts for magisters and the barracks of the city guard. So many of the ward structures are offices and meeting halls for business owners, solicitors, publishers, and the like that the castle ward has the smallest resident population of all the wards. Many landmarks of interest are found in this ward aside from the six walking statues, as I'll discuss later in this book. You could hardly see them all in a day, but the following are highly recommended. Blackstaff Tower is a squat black blot in an otherwise pretty ward. Humble though its edifice might be, looking on the place for too long can give you a queasy feeling and a sense that you're being watched, almost as if the tower has turned an unseen and wrathful eye upon you. Perhaps you think this is fanciful. Well, go try it out for yourself. On the opposite end of the mountain, close to the naval harbour, stands Mert's Mansion. Once a fortress-like and glowering tower, it has been upgraded with more delicate fashions of architecture since the return of its long-absent owner. Mert has quite a history with Danan, the proprietor of the Yawning Portal. Together they descended into the well as the entrance to Under Mountain was known in the olden days. Waterdeep used to throw criminals in the well, leaving them to die horribly in the Under Mountain's dungeons. Dernan and Mert entered the dungeon of their own free will, and not only that, but returned laden with treasure. Both used magic to extend their lives, but eventually parted ways. Mert kept on with a life of adventure, while Dernan built the tavern called the Yawning Portal over the well, and now, almost two centuries later, charges coins to descend into it. Not a bad way to part a fool from their money. The glorious spires of the morning, dedicated to Lathander, is one of Waterdeep's most beautiful temples, but it is rivaled in this ward by the Temple of Seldarine, dedicated to all the elf gods. The journey through Mount Melody Walk, a tunnel cut through Mount Waterdeep, 
to New Ullman's Academy of Music and Other Arts is a wondrous daytime excursion. The market offers a wild array of sights, smells and sounds in which folk might lose themselves for a ten day. The Font of Knowledge is a temple to Ogma, yes but also the city's largest public library. Titles written throughout the ages can be viewed here under the watchful eyes of the temple's priests. In short, if I can claim this section of the Enchiridion to be such, the castle ward offers far too many splendours to list them all here. The castle ward's colours are blue and purple, and its mascot is a griffin, typically depicted in gold. These borrow colours from the city's flag and reference the griffin cavalry, of course. Champions for the ward often come from among the ranks of the guard, the navy, or the cavalry. Although such competitors often have the advantage in races and competitions, their crowds of rapidly cheering fans are naturally much smaller than those of other wards. Trades Wards Shopping, shopping, shopping galore! Or eating, eating, eating! Or drinking, drinking, drinking! Or lavish accommodations or fine art or legendary parties. The market in the castle ward is the largest market square in the city, but the trades ward is like a market town in itself and is easily thrice the market size. This ward bustles day and night with activity, both on the street and on the balcony walkways that run the length of the blocks, and some are layered five stories high. Shop signs appear to leap out from buildings, whose sides are plastered with advertisements all vying for the attention of the eye. Glove shops, shoe shops, jewellery stores, perfumeries, flower shops, cake shops, Taverns, cafes, tea shops, inns, row houses, boarding schools, offices, dance academies, grocers, pottery stores, armor vendors. As long as it's not illegal, you can find it in the trades ward. But if you are looking for something illegal, the trades ward is a likely place to get that too. Do not do so loudly though. The city watch has a heavy presence in this ward, in the form of both open patrols and officers working out of uniform. As befits the place of much business, many guilds have their halls in this ward. Of particular note is the House of Light, the hall of the guild chandlers and lamp lighters. Outside the building, a wagon-sized mound of wax with hundreds of wicks is kept lit day and night, while being continually built up with adhered candles. Inside, the best works of the guild are put on display and sold, including not just candles of various colours, lamps and chandeliers, but elaborate waxwork constructions that depict all sorts of subjects from personages of note to dragons to complex and abstract lattices, all represented as fantastical candles. Magic users should be wary in the court of the White Bull. Long ago, this plaza was a grazing area for livestock, including an albino calf that was born here. The calf's owner built the White Bull Tavern, which thrived on the spot for years and gave the area its name. You'll not find the tavern now, though. It vanished, utterly destroyed during an infamous spell battle between the Archmage Tholongar the Mighty and the evil mage Shilwuretular and his apprentices. In the storm of magic that touched down here, Shil and his apprentices all perished and the fabric of the weave was rent, such that Azuth, the god of wizards, was forced to appear and set things right. He is said to have stitched reality and the weave back together, but a wrinkle in the fabric remains. To this day, magic brought to bear in the court of the White Bull sometimes goes awry, and the use of magic items and spells is forbidden in the area. The Trades Ward uses green and purple as its colours, and its mascot is the Mimic. This tradition supposedly arose because when mascots were first chosen, the Trades Ward took a chest of gold as its own, and was roundly mocked by its citizens of other wards for not picking a creature. Now, every four years, the ward reveals a new object for its mascot, declaring it to be the Mimic. The nature of the object is subject to much speculation and rumour until its unveiling. For months afterwards, the object became the source of practical jokes in Waterdeep. Rock gnomes and wizards cause illusionary mouths to lunge from real versions of the object. Artisans craft beautiful fakes out of cake or paper that are easily crushed when assumed to be real, and so on. As of the writing of this Enchiridion, the current mimic is a tankard. It is called the Southern Ward, not the South Ward. Waterdavians are particular about this, and if you insist on referring to it as the South Ward, expect to be corrected or thought a fool. 
The name derives not merely from its southerly location in the city, but from the southerners who settled in this district as the city grew. Today the ward still hosts the most travelling merchants who visit the city and is made up of many enclaves, blocks and streets primarily occupied by citizens who trace their ancestry to other realms. One can indulge in the finest halfling food here, enjoy the best singers of Kalashite music and examine the most stunning works of dwarven crafting. But the first challenge is finding where these treats are housed. The southern ward has long been a district of labourers catering to travellers, so its folk have adopted the architectural custom of building homes and businesses above stables or around inn-yards, near to where wagon trains are housed. Residents of the southern ward take pride in their legacy as overland travellers and hard-working folk, so it should be of no surprise that the ward's mascot is the mule. On their competition's flags, a pugnacious mule in rampant pose stands on a field of red and white, colours said to represent the blood and tears the people of the southern ward have shed during their labours. Not a landmark as such, but surely a sight that must be seen is the moon's sphere. This isn't a structure, but an event that occurs during every full moon, when a glowing spherical field of blue light appears in the square known as the Dancing Court. Any creature that enters the sphere finds they can fly about inside of it just by willing themselves to do so. For centuries, water Davians have used this supernatural event to develop a unique flying style of dance, but amateur enthusiasts aren't welcome except on certain daylight appearances of the full moon. Even when the full moon isn't out, the dancing court is worth visiting because of its adjacent feast hall, the Jade Dancer. During appearances of the moon sphere, People sometimes daringly leap into the field of magic from the balconies of this three-story tavern, dance hall, and inn. But the feast hall takes its name from a peculiar dancer within it, rather than those of the court outside. The Jade Dancer is an eight-foot-tall jade statue of a woman that is magically animated and dances for patrons, and on occasions serves as a bouncer. Elleminster has informed me that despite its dexterity and seeming fragile beauty, the Jade Dancer is as puissant as a stone golem, so enjoy the show, but don't get too rowdy. Dock Ward The Dock Ward was long considered the most dangerous district in the city, but the Field Ward has since taken that title. I don't doubt that the residents of the Dock Ward are glad of it, for in some respects this area has never truly deserved its bad reputation. Yes, aside from the Field Ward, this is the area where most Waterdeep's poor reside. Yes, it's home to some of the least literate people in the city. Yes, most of its taverns are inhabited by habitual drinkers, and far too many inns charge by the hour. But all must concede to this. The residents of the dock ward often work the hardest while living under the harshest conditions. Warehouses, poorhouses, and tenements dominate much of the area. Streets are steep throughout, and have few spaces alongside for pedestrians. Wandering through the ward can be a bewildering journey without a guide. Except in the immediate vicinity of the piers, shop signs and advertisements of any kind are rare, and warehouses and other businesses often have no sign at all. You either know where you're going and have a reason to be there, or you are lost, and likely a mark for a pickpocket, or worse. Street lamps don't fare well in the dock ward. Their candles, oils, and glass are all too regularly stolen or smashed. The Guild of Chandlers and Lamp Lighters make half-hearted attempts to repair the street lamps at the start of each season, but for most of the year, locals are forced to carry their own light when travelling these streets at night. The colours of the dock ward are burgundy and orange. The mascot is a swordfish that has always been depicted as green for reasons lost to time. The folk of the dock ward take competition seriously, and frequently draft their champions from rough-and-tumble sailors that come to the city. Some say they draft pirates, but this is pure slander. Frequent complaints arise that these women and men are more citizens of the sea than the dock ward itself, but if they register with the Magister and pay taxes, they are as welcome to compete as any long-term resident of Waterdeep. City of the Dead I could write a book about the City of the Dead. It is such a fascinating place, filled with so much history and so many stories. But alas, there would be few buyers for Volo's Guide to the City of the Dead, since it would be of interest mainly to Waterdavians, and the topic is one about which they already are intimately knowledgeable. 
The City of Dead is no drab cemetery. It is a great park of grassy hills, tended flower beds, artfully placed clusters of trees and bushes, beautiful sculptures, astounding architecture, and gravel paths that wend intriguingly through it all. Long ago, water Davians largely abandoned the practice of burying their dead, instead entombing them in mausoleums. For centuries, the major mausoleums here have each been connected to an extra-dimensional space where the dead are taken, mourned and interred. Those who can afford it memorialize the departed with sculptures, making the City of the Dead an open-air museum that features some of the most stunning, haunting, mournful, and downright eerie statues ever crafted in marble or bronze. Nobles and wealthy merchants have competed to erect the grandest markers for their dead, leading to a wide variety of styles and concepts created by artists at the height of their skill. One of the cemetery's most impressive attractions is the Warrior's Monument. This intricate 60-foot-high sculpture depicts a circle of women and men striking down trolls, orcs, hobgoblins, bugbears, and barbarians, all of which are falling backwards and outwards around the warriors. Above all of them, a flying griffin rider spears a skeletal knight whose breastplate bears the symbol of Merkel, god of the dead. But this statue is also a fountain, and the wounds on these combatants gush water. Don't try to imagine it. Just go see it. And see it as the water Davians do. Pack a midday feast and have a picnic, then take a stroll through the beauty of the place. Outside the city proper, there's more to the city of Waterdeep than just the wards within its walls. If you have need to visit the environs of the city, here's what you need to know. Field Ward This district was once a caravan yard between Waterdeep's two northernmost walls, kept free of settlements to serve as a killing field in times of war. As refugees from various calamities settled here after not being allowed into the city's wealthy northern region neighbourhoods, the area has grown up into a lawless town of its own. Though not an official ward of the city, the field ward is commonly referred to as one. The watch doesn't patrol the area, however, and many crimes go uninvestigated. The city guard oversees the field ward from within the walls around it, but its members get involved only when folk moving in and out of the city are threatened. The area is a muddy mess, populated by the poorest people and those who take advantage of those folks' desperation. It has no sewer system and isn't served by the Dung Sweepers Guild, a fact that will be quite evident to your nose if you ever venture there. I don't recommend that you spend any more time here than it takes to pass from one gate to the next. The Guild of Butchers operates several large slaughterhouses, smokehouses, and leather-making facilities in the area. Noisome operations have been pushed out of the city proper, a word to the wise. Being friendly with a burly fellow who is good with a knife is one of your best defences in the field ward. The other place you might solicit aid is Endshift Tavern, a popular stop-off for off-duty members of the city guard, situated on the corner of Endshift Street and the Breezeway. Though the guards might not be so inclined to assist you, your status as a visitor to Waterdeep technically obliges them to help you reach the city proper in safety. A side note on the wonders of the Waymoot. The place where the high road and the Way of the Dragon meet in the south of the city is called the Waymoot. At the centre of the crossroads, a high signpost stands with hanging arrows pointing towards the harbour and at each of the city gates. Created by the watchful order of Magists, and protectors and funded by the local merchants, the signpost magically directs travellers to well-known distant locations when the names of those locations are spoken in the crystal on the post. The magic of the way moot writes its destination onto the proper arrow of the signpost and indicates its distance from Waterdeep in miles. Folk are thereby sent out of the harbour or to the appropriate gate leading north, east or south, depending on their destination. Unfortunately for newcomers, the Waymoot is of no use whatsoever in finding locations within Waterdeep. You will, however, find a number of enterprising individuals near the crossroads who take advantage of this fact to offer their services as city guides. Though some reputable members of this cadre will guide you true for a fair fee, plenty of citizens with nothing to lose or gain by doing so will also readily set you on the right course if you're simply polite. Undercliff 
This area of rolling grassland and small wooded areas east of the city is a rural community focused on farming and animal husbandry, and which caters to travellers. It is also the site of a large and well-protected training camp for the city guard, and a prison farm run by the city watch, called the Amends Farm, where those convicted of minor offences work off their debt to the city. Many gnomes and halflings live in this region, and most buildings are built to reflect their stature. Two noble families have estates in Undercliff. The Amcathra estate is used for the housing and final training of horses bred in the town of Ampale, many of which are sold to the city guard. The Hothamer noble house has an estate where its members conduct business and overland trade, beyond the reach of Waterdeep's auditors. If you visit this area, I recommend the Sabedal Orchard and Meadery, owned and run by the Snoobedal Halflings. They have a delightful drinking hall and a shop size for larger patrons, and you can pick your own fruit when it is in season. Under Mountain Tales of this legendary dungeon below Waterdeep are told well by many in the city, but I'll provide you with the basic truths here. Beneath the plateau of Waterdeep lies the largest and deepest dungeon in the world. It sprawls out under the city and is said to plunge as many as 20 levels deep. The Malerkin dwarves first excavated the tunnels that would become Under Mountain, and the drow are said to have dug their own tunnels up from below. All were claimed, altered, and expanded by the mad wizard Halaster and his apprentices, who were believed to dwell in the dungeons to this day. What drove them deep into the earth remains a mystery, but Under Mountain's allure is a siren song that still draws many. If you want to see adventurers descend into the depths, or perhaps glimpse some returning with wondrous treasures, visit the yawning portal in the castle ward. The City's Splendours A description of each of the features that cause Waterdeep to be called the City of Splendours would require a library's worth of paper. This chapter can't hope to encompass them all, no matter its author's expertise with a quill. However, I shall endeavour to enlighten you about several sites that have not been mentioned earlier, and to expand upon some previously covered. Amenities. You'll find no city on the Sword Coast, or in the North Half as civilised as Waterdeep. It's not just the law of the land that makes this so, but also the comforts that life here provides. In most other towns and cities, you'll start with an early morning stumble on the stairs as you carry your night soil down to deposit it outside. But in Waterdeep, many buildings are connected directly to the sewers. Public facilities for those out and about can be found all around the market and the Field of Triumph, and near the largest city squares. In places without ready access to sewer or public outhouses, members of the Dung Sweepers Guild make multiple rounds each day, collecting urine and excrement separately for use in industry and agriculture respectively. Take comfort in Waterdeep, but you'll always find a pot to piss in. Also, notice how clean the streets are kept. This upkeep is due in large part to the hard work of the Dung Sweepers Guild. Dung Sweepers can be seen working their brooms and carts at every hour of the day, and for a few hours after dark, all over the city, removing not just animal dung, but other refuse. This service is free to all, paid for by taxes rendered to the city. Although an egregious amount of trash left for pickup does result in a separate bill from the Guild. Another amenity soon appreciated by visitors is Waterdeep's water system, with public fountains and wells all about the city. Clean water is plentiful. Many buildings have pumps of their own to draw water from the local supply, and some even possess taps that pour out water with a twist of a knob. This convenience is made possible by the inventors of Gondar, the industry of the Cellarers and the Plumbers Guild, and the magic that Waterdeep inherited from the Ilafani Elves. Waterdeep is also a city of light. Continual flame spells illuminate many signs and the street lamps in the wealthier parts of the city. Elsewhere, the Guild of Chandlers and Lamplighters keep streets lit, except for the Field Ward and the most dangerous areas of the Dock Ward. Not only that, but hundreds of drift globes bob about the city in the dead of night, departing to float over the rest of the city each morning. Such is not typical behaviour for drift globes, I assure you. Lastly, no city in the world is as literate as Waterdeep. Ogma's priests from the Font of Knowledge offer free instruction in reading to all who desire it, and the city has over 30 publishers of broadsheets in addition to chapbook printers and book publishers. 
Large paper advertisements are plastered onto alley walls, and smaller ones are passed out by those hired by businesses to trumpet their services. Printed menus can be found posted in the windows of most eateries and are handed out to those who dine within. Admittedly, you'll see less reading material in the dock ward and the field ward, but this fact is notable only because of its preponderance elsewhere. The Griffin Calvary Waterdeep doesn't have the fabled flying ships of Halrura, but it does deploy an aerial defense force. Brave warriors of the city guard light out from the peak top airy atop Mount Waterdeep, riding fearsome griffins that have all been bred and trained for that purpose. Each of the riders is equipped with a ring of feather falling, not merely to prevent death from mishap, but allow them to perform stunning feats of aerial acrobatics. In both martial displays and real battles against flying threats such as manticores, harpies, and outlaw wizards, the griffin riders actually leap off their mounts into the open air. For a breath-stealing moment, they fall like stones closing in on their targets at incredible speed. Their opponents rarely see the death blow, distracted as they are by the other mounted griffin riders. When they are past the danger, the free-falling riders then suddenly halt in the air, drifting like feathers until their griffin companions swoop in and they regain their saddles. Working in concert with one another in this fashion, members of the griffin cavalry can rapidly eliminate any threat to the city and even catch the body of an offender before it hits the rooftops below. Riders of the Griffin Calvary are trained to stay above the rooftops, not because they fear crashing into towers and weather vanes, but because the smell of so much horse flesh in the street below can sometimes drive their griffins into a frenzy. The Walking Statues Over a century ago, just one of these eight behemoths stood visible at the northern foot of Mount Waterdeep, on a bluff called Gull Leap. Ninety feet tall, it resembles a bold human staring out to sea. Later events, as discussed below, cause it to be transformed into a statue known today as the Sahagwan Humbled. When the spell plague gripped Waterdeep in 1385 DR, six more walking statues suddenly appeared in the city, wandering to wreak havoc even as the Sahagwan Humbled remained motionless. The activities of the citizens of Waterdeep succeeded in stopping three of these new statues, breaking the Sword Maiden and the Hawkman, and sinking the God Catcher into the street up to its waist. Then all the statues mysteriously stopped their rampage just as quickly as it had begun. Tassara Chardron of the Black Staff at the time couldn't command them to return to their former hiding places on the ethereal plane. Consequently, the city repaired itself and built up around them. Much later in 1479 DR, the eighth statue, the Griffin, emerged from the ethereal plane to defend Akaran's tower against intrusion. It roosted there for a time before flying to its current position near Peak Top Airy on Mount Waterdeep. Once more, this activity seemed to be outside the Blackstaff's control. Thankfully, all the walking statues have been dormant for well over a decade now, serving only as beautiful Cyclopsian reminders of Waterdeep's might. The God Catcher This is perhaps the most famous walking statue in the city. Thanks to its dramatic pose, its nearness to the market, and the self-evident magic of his existence. The statue is of a well-muscled but impassive male human with its left leg sunk into the hip of the street, as a result of a spell cast by Blackstaff at the time of its rampage. Its left hand and its right foot press against the ground as if trying to pull itself out. Its right arm is raised skyward, and above its open palm floats a sphere of stone. Its gaze looks up towards the sphere, and a pattern of bird dropping around its eyes gives the appearance of weeping. All about the statue, climbing up its chest and on its knee and shoulders, is a tenement that carries the name the God Catcher. The tenement's landlord, Ondra Blackcloak, is an unsociable sorcerer who is rarely seen in the city except when she alights from the door carved in the floating sphere, which serves as her home. On the rare occasions when she wants to meet with city folk, typically to purchase odd substances for magical purposes. She appears unannounced on balconies or rooftops after dark. Her dealings are polite, though, and she pays fair coin. She never confides in anyone or talks about her own doings. And if anyone but she has ever seen the inside of her spherical stone, they've said nothing publicly about it. The Griffin The walking statue called the Griffin is shaped like the beast for which it is named. Though it stands on all four legs, its back is a full 20 feet off the ground, making it a mount fit for a storm giant. 
Although it has shown itself capable of flight with the granite feathers of its wings spreading like a bird's, the griffin now merely stands in a regal pose near the peak top airy atop Mount Water Deep, looking to the southeast over the dock ward. Newcomers sometimes assume it used to be a monument to Waterdeep's Griffin Calvary, but Waterdavians know better. The Sahagwan humbled. For years, the only visible walking statue of Waterdeep was simply known as the Walking Statue. It stood at the foot of Mount Waterdeep, near the head of Jolthoon Street. Then, after its critical role in defending the city against an invasion of Sahagwan, in 1370 DR, Kelvin Blackstaff reshaped the statue into a Sahagwan, it now bows low towards the House of Heroes on bended knee, a gesture of obeisance to the city and an acknowledgement to the sacrifice of all who fought for the city in that war. The Great Drunkard This walking statue stopped its rampage as it approached the market, then fell backwards and sat upon a building. When it settled, its arms fell limp at its sides and its head tilted forward to its chest, giving the impression that it had fallen asleep. The statue's huge stone battle axe still stands nearby, its half angled upright and its blade half buried in the cobbles. The rubble of the crushed building was long ago rebuilt into a broad stone stair with railings and a ramp that drunkards are often rolled down that ascends from the cobbles to the statue's lap. That lap now holds a two-story tavern built from the rubble called Gralkin's Tankard. The unconscious pose of the statue and the tavern in its lap made the name of the great drunkard a natural fit. The Lady Dreaming This fair lady caused much chaos when she was active. The statue has the appearance of a female elf whose hair and clothing appeared to flow naturally as it walked through the city during the spell plague. When the walking statue stopped, this one toppled onto its side, taking on the appearance of a giant titanic sculpture of a noble lady asleep in her garden. The Honourable Knight the Honourable Knight is a statue of a male warrior in plate armour with a shield and longsword. When the walking statue stopped, it bowed to those opposing it, straightened and sheathed its sword, and doffed its shield, setting its point down on the ground and upright by its side. Then it ceased motion in this position, facing the southwest toward the harbour and looking for all the world like a castle guard standing at ease. The pose it assumed led to its naming, and it is viewed with respect by the citizens of the southerly wards. The Hawkman This statue looks like a winged, hawk-headed being, and the locals call it the Hawkman. I can reveal that in fact it bears much resemblance to an Arakokra, one of the bird people said to live in the star mounts in the high forest. The statue's wings are folded tightly against its back and have never unfurled, leaving its flight capabilities uncertain. It was brought low during its rampage across the city, and now tilts decidedly towards the northeast due to a missing right foot, long ago broken up for building rubble, along with its right arm. Its left arm extended out towards the north, palm forward, as if in a gesture to say stop. The body has been hollowed out and turned into a tower shared by several wealthy tenants, which is officially known as the Sparrant Tower after its owner. The statue's left hand extends over a courtyard to the north, wherein lies the entrance of a tunnel carved through the arm. Visitors and residents can ring a bell in the courtyard, whereupon a door guard acknowledges the ringer and lowers a rope ladder for tenants and expected guests, or a rope chair that is drawn up for guests who are infirm or laden with heavy items. The Sword Maiden This statue appears virtually identical to the Honourable Knight, except for its female form and open-faced helm. It was felled during the spell plague after causing much chaos and slaughter. The residents of Waterdeep's North Ward funneled much of their frustrated and dismayed reaction to its rampage into dismantling the statue, part of which now can be found all over the North Ward, either incorporating into buildings or as bits of the freestanding sculpture. The head of the Sword Maiden sits in a stand of tall trees in the centre of a block of the North Ward, bounded by Hasanta Street, Tassar Street, Wayongong's Way, and Usulbrand Street. The centre of its jaw and mouth have been replaced by a door, which leads into a shop known as Thought's Findings. Undeavour Thought is a wizened ex-adventurer who leans on a cane, which some locals insist is more than just a cane. He lives in a small shop whose many levels, staircases, and landings fill a hollowed-out interior of the head, and which is crammed with oddments sold by thought to adventurers and other travellers. 
These items bear little placards of Thought's beautiful flowing handwriting that identify them, or at least provide speculation as to their origin and purpose. Nobles and wealthy merchants who desire props for themed revels often rent some of Thought's wares as decoration, and many sages and alchemists and wizards visit him regularly in search of potentially useful items. Infamous Alleys Waterdeep has as many alleys as Baldur's Gate has cats, and each has a name and story. Here are a few that you might wish to see, or should know to avoid. Ruid Stroll this short avenue from Caravan Court to the Troll Wall in the Southern Ward is haunted by hooded ghosts of the Mage Ruid, whose touch causes deathly chills to those he meets on foggy nights. All attempts to banish or turn the spirit have failed. Those who brave its unearthly approach and allow Ruid to pass through them learn a secret truth about someone or something in their life, if they survive. Brindle Alley This is the lair of the hand that signs a magical phantasm of a hand with a mouth in its palm. The hand is said to snatch valuables at fancies, especially magical ones, when it encounters them, and to occasionally attack folk in the darkness, strangling them or tripping them into fatal falls. Most often, though, it takes no notice of those who don't bother it or follow it, eerily singing fragments of old Sword Coast ballads and love songs as it drifts through the night. Many Cats Alley this passage crosses two city blocks and winds through the interior of a third, running between and for the most part parallel to Junthun Street and Trader's Way in the North Ward. It is, unsurprisingly, home to many cats that feed on scraps from the surrounding butcher shops, but it is also known for the many carved stone heads of people and animals that adorn the alley's buildings. Individuals who have walked the alley alone report that some of the heads whispered cryptic messages to them. Gondwatch Lane Found on the southern entrance to the House of Inspired Hands in the Sea Ward, this alley serves as a testing ground for inventions considered too dangerous to operate inside the temple. The locals are generally unconcerned about risks though, and stand watching while food vendors circulate among them. Farah's Alley This alley in the Sea Ward is named after the first leader of the House of Wonder, but it is more infamous for its circle of skulls. This infrequent and unpredictable haunt takes the form of seven floating skulls, which hover in a circle and argue with one another in whispered tones about events in the city. If they are interrupted, their reaction reportedly varies from being helpful to engaging in murderous spell-slinging. The Three Daggers Alley This alley in the dock ward suffers from a magical curse that causes three daggers to appear out of thin air and attack passers-by. The daggers swoop and fly about, making multiple attempts at murder before vanishing again. This magical effect is the result of a spell cast by a long-dead wizard, and has resisted all attempts to dispel it. Some locals boast of how many times they've crossed the alley and lived to tell of it, but the appearance of the daggers is entirely a matter of chance, and unpredictable, so take my advice, and don't test Hymora's favour. City Celebrations at many times of the year, hardly a ten-day can pass in Waterdeep without the staging of some rite, race, or rousing ceremony of civic pride. Here I briefly summarise the most widely celebrated events on the calendar, from the first of Hammer to the last of Nightall. Hammer the First, Winter Shield. Marking the start of the new year, this observance is a widely recognised day of work. When folks sipped warm ciders and broths, often laced with herbs for health and to bring on visions, and stay inside. They tell tales of what interests them or what was important in the year just done, and discuss what they intend to do or should deal with, or things that everyone should keep a hawk's clear eye on in the year ahead. Such talk inevitably leads to discussions of politics and the intentions of rulers. Maps are usually consulted, and it's widely considered lucky to possess and examine a map on Winter Shield. Map sales are brisk in the ten day preceding this holiday. Ulturak the Fourteenth, the Grand Revel. Led by the clergy of Soon, Cherus, and Lyra, the Grand Revel is a day of dancing, music, and consumption of sweet treats of all kinds, from chocolates to red fire mint candies. Although some of the dancing is wanton and performed for show, Large-scale ring dances in the street for all ages are also popular. All the dancing ends at dusk, after which bards and minstrels perform at love feasts for families. 
Couples, or those desiring to become couples, slip away together to kiss, exchange promises, and trade small tokens of affection, often rings blessed by clergy with prayers of faithfulness. Even if you have no paramour, indulge a little in dance and food of this fine tradition. The night might be cold, but your heart will be warmed. Ches the First, Ryestertide. This holiday is named in honour of Lathander's first prophet, Ryesta, a young blind boy who was cured of that blindness by the dawn's light on this day more than seven centuries ago. That holy event occurred in the vicinity of Silvery Moon, but Lathander has long had a much larger temple in Waterdeep, and a following to match. Each of the faithful dons a bright garb of sunrise hues, and keeps one eye covered until the next dawn in honour of Ryesta. If you want to feel like a local, catch the eye of any celebrant you see and wink. Fine friendships have grown from far less. Chess the 19th. Fey Day. The veil between this world and the fairy realm of the Feywild is thought to be weak on this day. Though this phenomenon provokes caution in rural areas, with folks avoiding woodlands, putting offerings of food on the doorsteps and the like, it is an occasion of much drinking, singing and dancing in Waterdeep. The wealthy host elaborate masked balls, while the poorer folk don costumes of their own make and travel door to door, gaining brief entry into the celebrations in exchange for performing a song or a short play. All adopt the guises of fey beings and are supposed to be rulers of the fey wild, such as Queen Tatiana, Oberon, and Hearsome, the Prince of Fools. Those inclined to remain sullen in the face of such frivolity had best stay home, for celebrants do their utmost to evoke a smile from those they meet. Chess 21st to the 30th. The Fleet's Wake. This festival celebrates the sea, maritime trade, and the gods of the sea, navigation and weather. It spans the last ten day of chess, and includes a series of boat races, the shipwright's ball and the shipwright's house, and the guild-sponsored galas at the Copper Cup Feast Hall. All according to custom, the winners of the various competitions don't keep their trophies and earnings, but deliver them to the priests of Umberley at the Queen's Spire her temple on the beach by the east entrance of the Great Harbour, at the conclusion of the festival. The last two days of Fleet's Wake are the occasion of the Fair Seas Festival. During this time there is much feasting on seafood, the harbour is strewn with flower petals, and the city guard go from tavern to tavern collecting offerings for Umberley. Collection boxes also appear at large festival gatherings. Upon sunset of the final day, the collected coin is placed in chests and dumped into the deepest part of the harbour. This festival has existed in a number of forms since the first trade meets occurred here more than two millennia ago, and an uncountable amount of wealth remains sunken in what has long been known as Umberley's Cache. The area is closely watched by merfolk guardians, whose standing orders are to kill anyone attempting to disturb it. Rumours abound that the chests have magical protections. One story tells of thieves who stole some of the collection years ago and tried to leave the city under false pretenses, only to see a squall spring up as soon as their ship left the harbour. A huge wave shaped like a hand swept the thieves overboard, but spared the ship and its crew. Tasak, the first to the tenth. Wukin Tide. This festival has long gathered a number of older holidays under one name, stretching these celebrations into a holiday season that lasts a ten day. Among the rituals in homage to the goddess of wealth and trade are these. Caravans, Tasak the First. This gift-giving holiday commemorates the traditional arrival of the first caravans of the season into the city. Many parents hide gifts for their offspring in their homes, telling the children that they were left by old Caravas, a mythical peddler who arrived in the first caravan to reach water deep, his wagon loaded down with toys for children to enjoy. Golden Knight, Tasak the Fifth. This festival celebrates coin and gold, with many businesses staying open all night, offering midnight sales and other promotions. Some celebrants and customers decorate themselves with gold dust and wear coins as jewellery. Guilds meet, Tarsak the Seventh. On this holiday, guild members gather in their halls for the announcement of new policies and celebrations of business concluded for the year. These gatherings culminate in a gala festival and dance sponsored by several guilds, which lasts from dusk till dawn and overruns the market, the Sinusure, the Fields of Triumph, and all areas in between. The Ruin, Tarsak the Tenth. 
In times long past, Wakun caught Lyra, the goddess of illusion and deception, attempting to cheat her in a deal, and buried her under a mountain of molten gold as punishment. A commemoration of that event, the ruin is the day for guild members to pay their annual dues and for guildmasters to meet with the Lords of Waterdeep and renew their charters for another year. Myrtal, the sixth to the ninth, the ploughing and running. Rural areas around the city observe this holiday in the traditional sense of shared activities of ploughing fields and moving or running livestock. But within the city, the holiday is celebrated with a series of races. Foot, horse and chariot races are run through courses in each ward, and the winners from each ward compete at the Field of Triumph. If you really want to see the wards come to life, this is the time. Pick your favourite, wear its colours, and cheer alongside the residents. Better yet, if you're of an adventurous and bent, register in your favoured ward and compete. Who knows, your name or visage might soon have a place in the House of Heroes. Kithorn I, Troll Tide. On this day, commemorating Waterdeep's victory in the Second Troll War, children run through the city acting like trolls, banging on doors and growling. From high sun till dusk, home and shop owners are expected to give the children candy, fruits and small items. Those who give no treat can expect to become the target of tricks at sundown. This mischief typically takes the form of troll scratchings at doors and windows. Those with more malicious intent sing screechingly into the wee hours and hurl raw eggs at windows and signs and the heads of those who try to stop them. Have some candy on hand or some sweet rolls and all will be calm where you live. Kythorn the 14th, Guildhall Day. This day is a time of trade fairs. Most shops are closed and street sales are suspended for all but walking foot peddlers. Guildhall Day celebrates the fruits of everyone's labour with revelations of new products, innovations, fashions, and signage extolling the extent and quality of guild members' services and wares. These offerings usually take the form of glittering displays, but guilds sometimes also sponsor brief plays or other hired entertainments. Jugglers, singers, and magic shows put on by hedge wizards and professional raconteurs, at which prizes or free samples are distributed. Many guilds try to recruit during this time, Guildhall Day is an excellent time to browse the city's merchandise, and it doesn't matter if you can't afford what you can see, because you can't buy it all that day anyway. Kythorn the 20th, Dragon Down. This day in Kythorn is celebrated with bonfires and rituals to tame or drive down dragons. In Waterdeep, the celebrations take the form of parades that center around effigies built of wood and cloth and filled with straw. Each effigy is named and has a traditional depiction for it represents one of a handful of dragons the city has faced in its history. After being paraded to a square near where the dragon was defeated or driven off, the enormous effigy is burned. The height of the celebration comes when the effigy of Kistaranath the Red is burned on the slopes of Mount Waterdeep. A Dracolich version of Kistaranath is then carried up the slopes and burnt as well. These proceedings symbolize the defeat of Kistaranath by the first paladin Athar and again decades later by his son, Pigiran. Tradition dictates that the winners of the races run during the ploughing and the running take the role of the dragon slayers, with the champion of the chariot race representing Athar and the champion of the horse race playing Pigiran. Flame Rule the First, Founders Day. This day commemorates the birth of the city. The Field of Triumph is the site of illusionary displays that chronicle the history of Waterdeep as well as martial exhibitions by the guard and other worthies. Many feast halls sponsor the Founders Day costume contest, with prizes going to those who wear the best recreations of the garb of historical personages. Once banned as frivolous and distracting, the practice of veiling Castle Waterdeep with an illusion has been reinstated. Several mages come together to produce the effect, which seemingly transforms the castle into the ancient log fortress of Nemour. The illusion typically lasts from midday till sunset, unless someone has the audacity and magical might to dispel it, and is regarded as a stunning work of magical art. Flame Rule the Third to the Fifth, Sornan. Sornan is a festival of both Joaquin and Lathander, and is used for planning business, making treaties and agreements, and receiving envoys from unknown lands and traditional foes. Much wine is drunk over these three-day occasions, when, as the saying goes, my enemy is like family to me.
If you are a newcomer to the city, this time is an excellent opportunity for you to engage with new partners in business or to gain financial support for some endeavour. My agreement to write Volo's Guide to Waterdeep was signed on a warm Sornan evening many years ago, so who knows where your own initiative will take you. Flame Rule the Seventh, Lyra's Night Originally a celebration held only in Waterdeep, this holiday has since spread up and down the Sword Coast. It has received a recent boost in popularity from the custom started in Boulder's Gate of lighting celebratory smoke powder fireworks, all purchased from fellow Gears fireworks of that city and utilised only by the city's guard, of course. This night-long festival honours the Lady of Joy with dances and balls throughout the city. Pink beverages ranging from healthy juices to deadly strong intoxicants are imbibed. The boom and crackle of smoke powder explosions go off all night long, so you might as well stay up with the locals and enjoy the show. Elysis the First, Agherian's Day Many small rituals are held throughout this day, dedicated to honouring the first open lord. The lords of Waterdeep toast Agherian and the Watchful Order, and the guildmasters toast the lords in Agherian's name. Commoners leave violets, Agherian's favourite flower, around Agherian's tower, on his statue in the City of the Dead, and atop the altars of the House of Wonder. Bards perform songs in honour of wizards all over the city. The Open Lord visits taverns and inns throughout Waterdeep to wish the people well, giving short speeches and offering toasts in Agherian's memory, buying rounds of drinks or paying for meals or accommodation. Needless to say, Establishments of those sorts are generally full throughout the day. Elent the 21st, Bright Swords. On this day, the City Guard, the City Navy, and the City Watch, all in a glittering array, conduct parades, give demonstrations of martial skill, and stage mock battles. Those desiring to join their ranks are given a chance to demonstrate their prowess, usually with wooden practice weapons in contests against veteran soldiers. Makers and vendors of weapons sell their wares openly in the markets. Experts who can hurl or juggle weapons show off their skills, and the wards compete in wrestling and boxing matches. The most anticipated part of the day is when horses are cleared from the Field of Triumph and the surrounding streets, so that the Griffin Cavalry can perform aerial displays over the crowds in the stadium. Members of the Watchful Order present the Cavalry with illusionary foes to fight, allowing the Griffin riders to engage in thrilling battles as people watch. Marpanoff the Third, Day of Wonders The imaginative inventions of Gondar are revealed on this day and paraded throughout the city. These devices range from something as humble as a new cabinet hinge to a massive mechanical construct that walks or rolls about. Failure is the paramour of invention though, meaning it is a rare year where there isn't some notable disruption of the celebration. The flying chair of Machel was one such recent oddity, a device that worked marvellously on the way up, but was incapable of descending. Machel was rescued by the Griffin Cavalry, but his flying chair drifted away and was never seen again. Marpanoff the Seventh, Stoneshaw. Stoneshaw is an all faiths day during which folk strive not to be idle. Even children at play are encouraged to dig holes, build sandcastles, or construct crude models. Waterdavians consider Stoneshaw the best day of year to begin construction of a building, either by digging out the cellar or laying the foundation. The common wisdom is that folk who undertake new projects on Stoneshaw can expect blessings on their works in the coming year, whereas individuals who do nothing constructive on this day can expect all manner of misfortunes to rain down on them in the year ahead. Marpanoff the Tenth, Reign of Misrule Swift on the heels of Stoneshaw comes the reign of misrule. This day honours Bashaba, goddess of misfortune. People of the city are expected to break trust, belie oaths, and disobey the normal order, as long as no laws are actually broken and no rift is made that can't be later bridged. During the reign of misrule, nobles serve meals to their servants, children take control of schools, priests give worship to their god's foes, and any who wish to may participate in a guild trade. Pranks are played by one and on many, from simple tricks to those requiring elaborate planning. Sundown brings an end to the festivities, and most folks spend much of the night cleaning and reordering things for the following day. Many visitors decline to participate, but doing so often inspires misfortune rather than avoiding it. For fear of catching the bad luck of cynics, 
citizens do their best to avoid talking to anyone known not to have played along or dealing with them in any way until God's Day. Marpanoth the 15th, God's Day. This holiday observes the anniversary of the end of the God's War in 1358 DR, when the gods of Faerun return to the heavens. Private shrines are brought out into the open, and many people wear holy symbols of their favoured deities. A God's Day tradition in Waterdeep strictly limits the use of magic, in remembrance of the wild magic wrought during the times of troubles. Though not outlawed fully, spellcasting is allowable only in self-defence, or in cases of extreme need. At night, this holiday becomes solemn and serious, as many Waterdavians offer prayer and thanks for the lives that they have under their gods. The Griffin Calvary sets up an immense bonfire at the peak of Mount Waterdeep, honouring the fallen and the risen gods of Merkel, Siric, Kalembor, Mistra, Helm, and Eo who appeared here. In thanks for their defence during Merkel's invasion, and the resulting fires that raged through the southern dock and castle wards, God's Day is also a semi-official Be Kind to the Guards and Watch Day in Waterdeep. Feel free to participate by handing out small gifts and kind words, but be aware that any gift of a greater value than a few nibs might be interpreted as a bribe. Marpaneth the 30th, Liar's Night. This holy day pays tribute to Lyra and Mask to placate those deities and ward away their attention. Folk of all walks of life don masks and costume, magical or mundane, to disguise themselves and play at being other than what they are. Commonly seen masks include the black mask symbol of Mask and the mirror face of the priests of Lyra, but there are no bounds on the disguise you don, and the more elaborate and outlandish it is, the more celebrated the wearer. The festivities begin in the evening, when people place candles in hollowed out girds or pumpkins carved with faces. Each pumpkin represents a person donning a mask, while the light outside represents the truth of the soul. For as long as the candle remains lit, lies told and embarrassing things done don't sully a person's reputation, so celebrations often descend briefly into anarchic hedonism. Misfortune is said to come to anyone who returns to their pumpkins after celebrating it to find it unlit. So buy a candle of good quality and put your gird beyond the reach of the wind. Intentionally blowing out someone else's candle or smashing someone else's pumpkin is taboo and risks the wrath of both gods. Yet it does occur. Tricks and pranks of all kinds are common on this night and folk expect lies and foolishness. Pickpockets are rife on this day, so few carry much coin with them having secreted it away in the previous evening. Instead, people fill their pockets and belt pouches with candies. Traditionally, a pickpocket is meant to take the candy and leave a token in return, a tiny toy, a colourful paper folded into a shape or the like. But this has changed over the years into adults exchanging candies among themselves and simply gifting candy to children who ask for it. By custom, no deals are made nor contracts are signed on Liar's Night because no one trusts that parties will abide by them. Illusionists and stage magicians, whether through magical or practical abilities, make the rounds to entertain private parties, having been paid in advance the previous day, or to perform in public spaces, in the hopes that a good show will earn them a meal, and perhaps a place at a private party in the future. Uktar, Saloon's Halloween On whatever night in Uktar the moon is fullest, Water Davian celebrates Saloon's Halloween. The goddess is the focus of worship throughout the full phase, of course, but the major ceremony of this night is a parade of worshippers leaving the House of the Moon at Moonrise and moving down the harbour where the High Priestess wields the Wand of the Four Moons in a ceremony blessing all navigators. This holy relic is said to be the mace wielded by Saloon in her first battle against Shah, and again in a fight with her sister during the Time of Troubles. It miraculously appeared in Waterdeep after the God's War and has since been the focus of many divine signs. You can view it in the House of the Moon at other times of the year, but only from a well-guarded distance. If you're lucky, you might see the Wand of Four Moons weep, droplets said to be the tears of Seyun manifest on the mace from time to time, and are collected by the priestess for uses in potions that can heal, cure lycanthropy, and can be used as holy water. Uktar the 20th, Last Sheaf, sometimes called the Small Feast, 
This day of residential feasting is held in celebration of the year's bounty. Small gifts, traditional hand cakes of ale, jars of preserves, or smoked fish and meats are exchanged among neighbours, and last letters are gathered for carriages by ship captains and caravan merchants, so called because they are the last to leave the city before travel becomes difficult. Of Waterdeep's many celebrations, this one is perhaps the most relaxed and relaxing. Plan to spend a little extra on good food and enjoy a meal with those nearest to you, be they dearest hearts or the folk across the hall at the inn. Night or the 11th, Hal Down. In honour of Malar, members of the city guard leave the city in groups on this day to hunt down known threats to farmers and travellers, including brigands, wolves, owlbears, ogres and trolls that haunt the roads by the wilderness. These hunts typically last no longer than a 10 day, during the same span of time, the city watch engages in its own rigorous hunt for malefactors within the city walls. If you've any reason to doubt your standing with the eyes of the law, avoid Waterdeep for at least a 10 day after Howdown. With no real hunting to do of their own, the children of Waterdeep spend Howdown engaging in mock hunts of adults dressed as monsters and play at the killing of these predators. Night or the 20th, Simril. When dusk comes on this day, folk go outside to locate particular stars that were lucky for their ancestors, or that were associated with their own births. They then attempt to stay up throughout the night, celebrating outside with bonfires, song and warm drinks. Cloudy nights often draw larger crowds than clearer ones, since glimpsing your star through the haze is thought to be a blessing from Timora. Inside buildings, service folk keep fires roaring and engage in making food to keep celebrants fed through the long night and into the morning of the next day. If you have no particular star of your own, you'll find many vendors of star maps willing to divine which is yours, based upon your place and date of birth, and to point you in the right direction for a shard or two. Parting words. Well, gentle readers, you've reached the end of my Enchiridion. If you've yet to arrive in the city, its splendours await you. If you're reading this within its walls, please set aside this chapbook to experience the city. You might even see an extraordinarily handsome author hard at work, reviewing one of Waterdeep's drinking establishments. If you do so, I greet you in advance. Well met. Autographs cost seven nibs.